What up, YouTube? Web Mike here, and I would like to talk about James Cameron's Avatar. Now, I saw it back in 2009 when it came out in theaters and was blown away by the visuals. The story was okay. Characters were really engaging, and that seems to be a staple of James Cameron's movies, where he has these high-concept ideas, but he always thinks about, well, how can I get the mass market in on this? So with Titanic, he wanted to make a story about the failings of technology, but thought, well, how am I going to get people in to watch the theater? Well, I'll throw in a romance story that, that's reminiscent of Romeo and Juliet. Bang. It's a hit. And similarly with this one, I've heard it compared, and, and, and myself made the comparisons to many similar movies such as Fern Gully, Last Samurai, Atlantis, Dances with Wolves, and that's not meant to be a derisive element. There's so much creativity out there that people might make similar things without being trying to copy each other or make carbon copies. Now, the carbon copies is where you should get a little irritated because now you're not giving us anything new. Um, things that differentiate Avatar to others I'll get into later. But without spoiling too much, Avatar opens... And I'll be speaking, speaking specifically through the Collector's Edition, which I highly recommend you uh, check it out. Yes, yes, it tacks on another 18 minutes, but man, do they add so much to the movie. So we open up on Earth, and it looks like a cyberpunk dystopian future. There's neon signs everywhere. It wouldn't look out of place from Blade Runner. The world looks... Earth looks dirty. There's no other way to put it forward. And we see Jake Sully come in and try to make the best he can of his situation. But we see he has a heart of gold because when he sees a lady being pestered by someone at a bar, he makes sure to get in the middle, annoy him, and stop the whole thing. So that's very endearing to him. But more importantly, there's the atmosphere we get from Earth, which... It just appears to be literally just a machine that will just... People go into it, get churned, and they either die or get spat out, and they're just a useless husk. Now, conversely, when we go to Pandora, it seems very scary, brutal, and it is. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Colonel Corridge is right to say that everything in here wants to kill you and eat you, because that is the way nature goes. However, once we get through the initial foyers into the wilds of Pandora, we begin to realize that the world, as brutal as it is, it is beautiful, and the natives, the Navi, have this connection with the planet. So instead of being churned into a system on Pandora, you have a linked system that you're a part of, you contribute, and then eventually when you're done, you still contribute through your afterlife. It's a really beautiful way to look at it. Now, if I was to give it a rating... Oh, wait, no, I, I shouldn't do that yet. So, Jake Sully gets in, gets acquainted with his own avatar body that apparently you just go into a little MRI-like tube machine, and then your mind just jumps over to the Avatar body. Now, logistically, this gives its own questions because I began wondering, well, how does sleep work? Because your body is still active, or at least your mind is. Are you resting while you're in your, your Avatar body? Because then that means you're really only active in it for maybe eight hours because you need to sleep for eight hours. You, you're you in your avatar body for eight hours, and then the other eight hours is, what, you go into the bathroom getting food? But that wasn't really... It kind of was brought up in it, especially in the deleted scenes or, or, in, the, or in the Collector's Extended, because we see Grace, Sigourney Weaver's character, constantly trying to make sure he's getting his proper nutrition as he's going in, and we see this uh, later on in the movie, too, 
in the theatrical theatrical cut. And another interesting thing that comes up later is the Navi call these humans that remote insert into the Avatar bodies dreamwalkers. And it's not too inaccurate because you are technically asleep while you're in there. And initially, Jake's very distrusting and scared of the Navi, but when the chieftain's daughter, Natiri, sees these little, they're almost like jellyfish, but they're called seeds of Awa, just flit about and land on him and all over him, or land on the bow just before she's about to shoot it at him. She then takes this as a sign that Awa has more planned for him. Now, the visuals are definitely something extraordinary in this, not just because of the 3D effects. And I remember when I saw it in theaters with the 3D IMAX glasses, I would often feel I had to swat away some bugs or some leaves that were coming up onto the screen because it just felt that real. And that might have been what led to, this is such a millennial problem, post-Pandora depression. Because it's so beautiful, it's so immersive, and you feel so in tune with it that suddenly, oh, you, you, you get out of the theater and then life sucks. What a millennial problem to have. But thankfully, I never had to suffer from that. So, Jake takes his time to get acquainted with the Navi and learn their ways. And initially, it's so... The Corp and Courage can find a way to not desecrate any holy sites or just get them to move from their home base so they can find a new unobtainium site. Oh yeah, that's another thing. That, it's a, unobtainium is this really valuable metal. It has all these great properties, but we don't really get much more into it because the movie has not enough time. It's almost three hours, but hey, we don't have time to explain why unobtainium is so valuable and why we're only mining under home tree. There's no other ones we can go to. Now, it would have been really easy to just throw in a line or two about, oh, well, you know, it, 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 it it's so cost effective to go there because all the other deposits are small and it just wouldn't be worthwhile to get to them because it, we, we would invest so much time setting up equipment, moving, all the, all the resource expenditures to get to it. And that would have been nice, but I understand it. He doesn't want to interrupt the flow of the movie too much, but it is a bit of a pet peeve. And then there's also the talk about earth is dying. Oh, how? Die. It looks bad. I didn't see it die though. I didn't see it dying. But anyway, Jake Sully takes his time to get more acquainted with the locals, learn their ways, and he begins to love what he sees. It's just so nice. And part of it is because he gets to walk again. But the world he's experiencing is so much beyond anything he's ever comprehended. And then there's this other scene where he has to make a Zahelu or bond with one of the banshees that flies around. And I think it also happens previously on one of the, I can't forget what they're called, but they're like horses. This was a really cool idea with this bio jack that goes on between the Navi and some of the animals. A lot of it was done really well, but like suddenly you begin to feel and sense what the animal is. But I wish we got to see more because if you were to do that, suddenly you would be seeing through its eyes and it would be seeing through your eyes almost simultaneously. How would that look? Now, I understand that would be kind of perplexing to do on the screen. I can understand why maybe they didn't bother with that. But there are some other things, such as animals seeing in different vision ranges than we do. That would have been cool to incorporate into this. Like, um, uh, for instance, dogs in our world, they... They sense the world primarily through smell. How would that happen with us if we were to try that? And how would that look, say, in Avatar? That would have been a cool thing to go into. But again, I understand the movie's trying to move along. And then we get to the real crux of it, where he has to make this decision between trying to convince the Navi to move 
and trying to not be a cog in in the machine that, that, that just wants to pave over everything. And this is where the movie loses a bit of its punch because the humans are almost cartoonishly villainous because they just wanted an excuse to pave over Home Tree and just get to the, the deposit. I mean, that's fine, but it doesn't give the villains much depth. But we do have one scene that I love immensely, and that's when Colonel Courage sees Jake trying to flee to get to another Avatar lo location, and he just shouts out, Breach! And he kicks the door in. Well, he, he shouts out, Breach! Sucks in a breath, kicks down the door, and then begins trying to shoot him as he's, uh, as he's fleeing. I love that in the villain. It shows attention to detail, planning, competency. All beautiful to have in a villain. Now, I'm not going to spoil too much more, but if you've seen, as I said, the previous movies, Dances with Wolves, Fern Gully, Atlantis, The Lost Empire, or... Did I already say Fern Gully? Anyway, if you've seen those movies, I think you know pretty much how this goes. But, overall, I would still probably give it a 7 out of 10. It was beautiful immersive, characters are good, story's a little brain dead at times, but it's a beautiful escape, man. So that's all I have to say about Avatar. What about you guys in the comments below? Drop a like if you think I made good points, or hey, tell me if I missed a few things with a comment or two, man. But that's all I gotta say. Web Mike, out.